Um, so this, as you know, is the theme, has been the theme for the talks this year. Um, I'm just going to remind you of the trajectory because this is the last talk um, for the year and in the entire series. So if you remember in the first, uh, in the first term, we had this series of talks which started off looking with Oliver Mabouf's um, discussion of the Chiasma project he's involved in and the films he's making now, of various kind of artistic cultural interventions to deal with essentially marginalized groups in Paris. Um, but most of last term's talk was around a kind of sociology of contemporary racism and anti-racism and how it's been figured up in terms of what are called neo-nationalisms, which are the sort of strong nationalisms have taken over a lot of countries, not just in the West, but um, across the planet in the last 10 or 15 years. Um, and why that happens and responses to it and so on. Um, then in the first half of the second term, we looked at how people in the art space have been taking up questions of racism and also importantly anti-racism in different configurations, depending on what the particular politics and sociologies involved are. And then what we've been doing uh, over the last three weeks is again looking at specific um, uh, practices which deal both with racism and also social and social and economic social and ecological justice um, uh, together uh, altogether. So um, it's in that context that I'm going to introduce tonight's speaker, Olufemi Taiwo, with a talk early capture. Um, so just as a quick introduction to uh, Femi's work. Um, I came across it initially through a series of articles on uh, that he's been work, uh, theme he's been working on uh, on elite capture, which Femi will talk about this evening. So I don't want to rehearse it too much here. Um, but I was quite excited looking at that work and also um, the other work that Femi's done on uh, other forms, uh, other moments of social injustice uh, and the politics of environmental justice and forthcoming climate breakdown politics and economics. Um, one that Femi is kind of putting these things together in a way that's kind of philosophically, conceptually coherent, but also suggests a, a particular political configuration, which I thought would be interesting and compelling actually for us to, to talk about. Um, but also in terms of the overall theme of racism and anti-racism, um, while, while the imperative is kind of clearly understood, uh, and of course, this is, as, as with lots of institutions, we've been, um, uh, it's kind of became a really urgent issue after George Floyd's killing um, in, in the States. Um, but we've, we've tried to deal with it through a number of angles and also trying to deal with it institutionally. Um, but, but one of the kind of missing questions in this is like, who's the beneficiary? Like who announces anti-racism and who is it for? Um, and if you think in the UK about the Tory party, the party current in government, which is a right wing and extremely neoliberal corrupt party, um, they seem very relaxed about certain form of liberal anti-racism um, at the same time as uh, you know, deploying extremely racist policies against other groups. Um, last week, there was a controversy in this country around the royal family and declarations of uh, the royal family's racism. But again, the question is um, who, who articulates that and what kind of racism or anti-racism is being called for in that move. And it's clear that that's not necessarily a kind of uh, a, a demand for anti-racism in terms of a broad, um, broad claim to social justice. So there seemed to be something there that still needed to be entangled. Uh, and I'm very glad that Femi is doing the last talk because in a way, it serves as a recap of the kind of underlying politics uh, and demands um, that we've been, we've been carrying throughout the whole series. But I don't think I've really come into focus very clearly. And I think Femi's work lets us get to that. So just to say again that um, Femi has very kindly agreed to do this talk in the middle of a very busy teaching schedule. And he also has a meeting starting in just under an hour and a half. Um, so we've really got to crack on with this. And I really want to thank you Femi for coming in to do this. Oh, just as a quick introduction, Femi teaches in Georgetown University in Washington, DC, and he's written several articles which are on the VLE, um, at several aspects of, of his interests, which we'll cover in this talk and the questions. He's also working on a book uh, with a novel theory on reparations. I think that's right. Okay. Um, 
All right, so I'm going to hand over to Femi. I'm sorry for being so quick, but I understand the urgency of your, your time schedule. Thanks for having me. Um, I'm glad to be able to talk with you all. Um, and um, as was mentioned, uh, I'm going to move quickly just because I want to hear from everyone, but um, and rather, you know, rather than just hear myself talk. But I really want to nail down the kind of philosophical angle of um, what I've started referring to as being in the room and what it has to do with anti-racism and what it has to do with social justice politics in general, but especially as we tend to perform them in these kind of elite spaces that we all have access to. Um, and so I wanna say a little bit about that and then hopefully we can have a discussion about it. Um, so if you're in the kinds of rooms that I'm in, you've probably heard people say things like this. Um, you know, as a black person or a person of color um, or um, asking for certain voices to be centered. What that is in my realm of things in social and political philosophy, um, where it comes from is this idea that's been called standpoint epistemology was um, originally developed by um, explicitly Marxist thinkers like uh, Georgi Lukash um, was taken up very fruitfully by feminist thinkers, um, both in uh, socialist feminist traditions and other traditions. Um, and it's come to be associated with that realm of thought. And if you look at a textbook, you know, you look at something like the International Encyclopedia of Poly Philosophy, you'll find um, some well thought out, nuanced, um, and I think also innocuous claims. So feminist standpoint theorists claim that knowledge is socially situated, that marginalized groups are themselves socially situated in ways that give them some advantages, some contingent advantages in getting certain kinds of knowledge, and research should take this into account, right? So all that seems fine, and I would go as far as to say that all that is fine. I, I think that is just clearly true. Um, if you care why, there's a slide with the thought experiment that um, posts one kind of argument for why. Um, but I think if you have anything like a plausible picture of social reality, um, different people are going to be in different situations. Um, and as a result, they're going to have access to different kinds of information. And as soon as you take that into account, you've basically just said this thing, right? You've basically just said the thing that feminist standpoint theorists have been saying. But nevertheless, this is controversial. People get very angry about this. People, you know, this is fodder for culture war. This is, gets connected to all kinds of other things, whether it's um, cancel culture or wokeness or uh, critical race theory and so on and so forth. And that's on to something, right? It, it certainly has to do with all these other things, these larger cultural touchstone issues. Um, but nevertheless, you know, it's this innocuous, I think very obviously true set of contentions. So what's the problem? But, you know, the right wing has their own set of problems with this, which is just that they oppose the kind of politics that the people who espouse these kinds of things tend to support. Um, but it's not just them. I think, you know, I take myself to be um, at the level of the issues on a team with the people that say these sorts of things. Um, but nevertheless, when people say in these elite spaces, I have access to things like we need to center the most marginalized or pass the mic or believe a certain kind of person or center a certain kind of person. Um, I nevertheless have gotten the impression that something is weird is happening um, or something that's not obviously entirely correct or not obviously entirely unobjectionable. And, you know, one way of saying, you know, what that nagging feeling is, is by this kind of juxtaposition. And you'll see another one in a second. But, you know, in these spaces where these phrases get said, I hear a lot about, a lot less about 
inadequate housing or homelessness or water access or um, the ability to um, stay in one's home and not be displaced by conflict or climate crisis. Um, and the people affected by these things are real people, not imaginary people. And if they are supposed to be the one centered by such discourses, it's not obvious to me that that's what's happened, right? So there seems to be some kind of problem, but the problem isn't um, in any way that I can identify keyed to the particular theoretical claims that standpoint theorists make in academic journals. So if the problem isn't the basic idea, what is the problem? I think what is at root here um, are at bottom different theories of change or different ways of thinking about how it is that we get political and social structures that are oppressive, that are unfair, that are unjust to be better than they are. And I always think of this quote that is um, attributed apocryphally to Kwame Ture. Um, it sounds like the kind of thing he would say, uh, but I can't find where he said it, but whoever said it, it's awesome. And the quote goes, if a white man wants to lynch me, that's his problem. If he's got the power to lynch me, that's my problem. Racism is, racism is not a question of attitude, it's a question of power. That says very plainly the kind of thing that um, I think is related to what's going wrong in um, kinds of discourse about anti-racism and anti-oppression as I perceive them. Um, and so I think that quote is powerfully related to another juxtaposition um, that I mentioned this earlier. You know, I hear people ask a lot how they can understand the lived experience of marginalized people or overcome their implicit biases. Um, they ask, you know, what it is that people in positions of power may or may not understand about what it is to be marginalized. What does, what does the US think should shape global politics and level of values? Um, what do lawmakers think should shape domestic politics at the level of values? And I can't help but notice that people rarely ask um, these kinds of questions about other domains of social life. People rarely ask how we can get um, creditors, that should say, to better understand, sorry, how we can understand debtors to better understand the living, ex lived experience of bankers and payday loan company owners, or how we can get prisoners to unlearn their unfair stereotypes of prison wardens or correctional officers. Uh, people have fewer questions about what values Madagascar thinks should inform global politics. Um, and that's because though, when we invert the power dynamics, we um, find, we kind of reflexively realize that it's actually power doing the work um, and not so much the kind of um, opinions, base attitudes, or even performative rhetoric and etiquette around anti-racism or anti-oppression. It's very clear that what explains how prisons work is not what the prisoners think, but what the warden and COs think that what explains debt collection are the people who have issued the debt and not the people who owe it for the most part and so on and so forth. So springing from that, I think we can say something with a little bit of generality, right? There's, there's a view out there of racism that treats it as primarily an ideology. I'm not denying that racism involves ideology. Um, I'm just saying as Kwame Ture said on this slide, it doesn't strike me as the most important thing, right? Um, so on that view, racism is a description of beliefs, anti-racism, and I'm just using racism as an example. We could run this for gender or caste or ability or whatever it is that we'd like. Um, anti-racism, anti-oppression becomes a matter of character, both of the anti-racists themselves and of those they wish to influence. Such politics is organized tightly around allyship, and performance of um, solidarity or of what appears to be solidarity. And the theory of change that seems as assumed by this perspective is that if we change people's hearts and minds or maybe their etiquette, that we will somehow 
get from there to a better structure, that we will get from there to closing the prisons and um, building the accessible buildings and dismantling the patriarchy. But there's another view, and this is the view that I have that I think has more going for it, on which racism is a description of our social organization, not of any particular person's attitudes or beliefs. Thus, combating it is a matter of how power is arranged, a matter of strategic position, a matter of which forces are winning and which forces are losing. Um, from there, um, it seems like we should organize around solidarity in an organized sense. And the point of doing that would be to change the balance of power because that's what one would think will change the desired outcomes. So I'm just gonna present that view. Um, and then I'm gonna talk about this. I'm gonna talk more squarely about this um, idea about how it is that we govern our interactions in elite spaces, but spaces in general, I think, um, and what that has to do and what it doesn't have to do with these, you know, defeating oppression in the structural sense. And the key question for me about this is, who's in the room? And all I mean by room is space where we interact. So you and I, we're all in a room together right now. We're in a position to talk to each other. I'm talking to you. Later on, you will talk to me. We're in a room in this sense. And I think many of the ways that we think about anti-racism, many of the ways that we put standpoint epistemology and our social justice norms into practice um, are about managing how these interactions go. Um, they give us concepts for managing them. Is this person gaslighting this other person? Is there epistemic injustice happening? So on and so forth. So how do we govern interactions in the room? The basic problem with that focus, as I understand it, is that the parts of social structure that determine which interactions we have, and I think maybe even more importantly, which we don't, are actually far more important to um, the causes that we care about, to the balances of power that we care about um, than how it is that these interactions go while we're in the room. And from that basis, um, we can um, think differently about what kinds of things we should do if we wanna live out our standpoint epistemology principles or any other principles that we have about social justice. Right? We could focus on our interpersonal interactions. We could focus on our moral standing in the group. We could fo focus on how we distribute power in the room, um, or we could think more expansively. We could think, um, what is the world like such that there are rooms like this one? We could focus not on distributing power in this room, but distributing power in general in the world that requires a practical focus. And that requires thinking about how the interactions we do have relate to the interactions that we don't. So redistributing power within, but also across the rooms. And all of this probably sounds like gibberish right now, but all this is dirt clearing. This is setting the stage. And hopefully in a few minutes, it'll make sense why I'm taking these positions. So, um, I'm going to say a bit about selection. I'm going to say a bit about deference and why we defer, and then start talking about alternatives. So let's talk about this room, this interaction that we're having, right? You all are at Goldsmiths, which I hear is a very cool place, um, and you know one that is well respected, right? Um, I'm at Georgetown also a well-respected place, um, a well-resourced place. How did, and that, that I'm a fancy academic has probably something to do with why I've been invited here. Um, so how'd that happen? Well, how do we get into rooms? Our social systems function as filtering me mechanisms. They determine what interactions someone has and with whom they have those interactions. And I can say a lot about my participation in this room. It has to do with the immigration laws of the country in which I grew up, the United States, 
which for a majority of the 20th century had um, made legal immigration with a path to citizenship almost exclusively available to people of European descent. Um, that changed in the mid 60s with a law that preferred skilled labor. It was under that new revised legal regime that my parents were able to emigrate from Nigeria, um, which was a protectorate of the British Empire when they were born to the rich and powerful United States where I grew up. Um, I grew up in a Nigerian American community full of skilled professionals like my parents. Um, it's one of the more successful immigrant populations in the United States. Um, people often focus on that rather than the 82 million Nigerians who live on less than a dollar a day. Um, but uh, that, yeah, I'll leave that comment there. Um, that helped explain my class advantages. It helped explain um, what I experienced in school. It helped explain what heights I was able to reach in the higher education system. And at the end of that chain of causality is me in the assistant professorship at Georgetown University. What is that an example of? Well, the rooms of power and influence like this one are at the end of causal chains with selection effects. As we get higher and higher, social experiences narrow. Some students are pipelined to PhDs and others to prisons. And sometimes when we get in these rooms, uh, the academics in the rooms with me encourage me and others to defer to those who are um, of uh, more marginalized categories of identity like, like mine uh, as a black person. Um, but deferential ways of dealing with identity and standpoint, if you will, inherits the distortions caused by these selection processes. It's actually the things that make me different from the 82 million Nigerians that are the explanation of why you and I are having this interaction as we speak right now. That sets up what I've been calling elite capture, which is when Group resources or projects are diverted to serve elites and come under their control. I think practices of deference, uh, managing the interior politics of the rooms that we end up in, can actually make this epistemic situation worse for marginalized people. For example, if they if attention to spokespeople from marginalized groups like myself, for example, um, substitutes for attention to effective action in the social system that marginalizes them, right? So they say, um, invite Olufemi Taiwo to a talk instead of saying, um, support unions, which are disproportionately populated by black working class people, for example. And I think this kind of confusion functions as a racial Reaganomics. This is a much cooler sentence in the United States but um, if you know who Reagan was, is you know, basically Thatcher, right? Um, but, you know, um, this confusion ends, I think relies on fantasies about the exchange rate between the attention economy and the material economy. As far as I can tell, there's just no obvious relationship between giving attention to spokespeople or elites from marginalized groups and the um, fate or life chances of those marginalized groups as a whole, right? There are many contingent relationships, but we'd have to be doing um, very deliberate politics um, on the other side of the, that kind of distribution of attention. So why do we defer? It's not that deference doesn't matter, right? Um, the advantaged people from marginalized groups who end up at fancy schools are people like anyone else. They deserve respect, dignity, and some measures of recognition, and they are often um, denied those in part or whole. I think people have a tendency to try to read this in overly cynical ways, trying to say that um, the people who are doing this kind of deference politics don't really want social change, but just the appearance of it. 
um, or they want to distract from the fact that they have enough in the room privilege to um, have their lifting up of a marginalized perspective matter. Um, but I don't think that's right um, for a couple of reasons. Um, I think these norms often are an improvement locally speaking or you know, compared to what was going on before on the epistemic procedures they respond to. If you've ever sat through a lecture where people were um, you know, falling over themselves to figure out what Hegel or Hobbes or whichever dead white person was really thinking, and you know, there are ways to do worse than this kind of deferential procedure. Um, but nevertheless, um, I don't think that people are making the, that people are always making the mistake of just being cynical. Um, for the simple fact that them being a good or bad roommate isn't the problem for the exact same reason that being a good roommate, managing these interactions well isn't the solution. Because what interactions we're having in the first place is the thing I've said we should focus on. And so I want to make good on that and not try to blame this problem on people who are trying to manage a situation that from the outset isn't very good, right? The unequal distribution of life chances and opportunities. Um, once we're starting from there, we're already in a losing position, whether or not we do good things with the interactions we have after that structure is in place. And to say even more in the way of fairness to people who are, you know, doing the best that they can, you know, I think people might be elites relative to the larger group they represent, some statistical context, but that is not to talk about experience, right? Um, the fact that 82 million people live under much worse economic conditions than I do, and that we're all Nigerians, doesn't mean that when I go into, um, you know, when I go into the classroom as a Nigerian person that I get treated well. It's just not what that means. Um, so I might not be advantaged or privileged in the rooms that I experience. Um, and those are the rooms that I experience. Those are the rooms in which I develop my political subjectivity. So those are the rooms um, where I understand what it means to be black or Nigerian American or whatever other identity um, I may use to navigate the world, right? It's the experience that I do have and not the statistical context that explains how it is that I think about my identity. That is to say that the very strength of standpoint epistemology um, becomes its weakness when we combine it with the wrong practical norms. Because after all, um, it may be that the rooms I never need to enter, um, the parts of Nigeria I never need visit in order to um, get on in the world, have more to teach me about my place in the world than um, the mistreatment I encounter in academic spaces. From there, I think we get um, a pair of families of problems that are mutually supporting. For people who defer, um, the habit can supercharge moral cowardice by providing social cover for the abdication of responsibility. It says any marginalized person that ends up in an elite space, in an elite institution, um, it is now your work to decide what the space ought to be, to decolonize this room or this institution. It's your work to figure out what this, what art or what political science should have looked like if it weren't for oppression. Um, and it usually involves, um, I think, a sanitized and caricatured picture of those very people that are asked to shoulder the work. And for those who are deferred to, um, I think it supercharges um, a related set of problems. Um, a provocative observation that Sarah Schulman makes in the book, Care Conflict is Not Abuse, is that um, both trauma and the feeling of superiority that bigoted people have result in similar kinds of behaviors despite coming from you know, very different reasons and very different, you know, very importantly different um, histories. 
Um, both of those result in misrepresenting the stakes of conflict, often by overstating harm, and by representing the independence of others as hostility or um, hatred. So that's a set of problems. Um, I'm gonna say just a little bit about what it is that I think we should do instead, taking my cues from the residents of Flint, Michigan, um, and then um, I'll look forward to talking with you all. Um, so I remind you of this thing that I brought up earlier, which I hope makes a little bit more sense now. Um, if we're looking at how interactions go in the room and we're trying to live out our anti-racist norms or anti-oppression norms in the room, we end up focused on interpersonal interactions. We end up focusing on our kind of moral focus in terms of um, moral standing and social standing. Are we centering the right people, performing the right etiquette? Um, and it focuses on the interactions that happen in front of us, that happen in the rooms, that happen where we're paying attention. But if we were really thinking about the social structure directly, we'd be less focused on what's happening in the room and more focused on what's happening in the world in general, whether or not we're around to see it or experience it ourselves. That would focus us in turn on practical results and redistributing power, even in spaces where we aren't experiencing the interpersonal interactions ourselves. Um, I imagine it's a little clearer, but I think, you know, you still might be wondering, well, what exactly does that mean? So here's an example. In Flint, Michigan in 2014 to 2015, the Michigan Department of Environmental Quality um, had a team of 50 trained scientists at its disposal and covered up a health crisis, which was due to the fact that the water in this city in this state was unsafe to drink. They, that state institution produced uh, propaganda, produced um, documents claiming that the water was safe um, and did so um, without even the use, without even the use of a local elected official. The city was under the control of an emergency manager, an unelected executive official. It's actually much like colonial governance. So they didn't need their oppression to be centered or celebrated. They didn't need new jargon to use to describe the poisoning of their children. Um, they didn't need deference in and of itself in elite spaces, right? The kinds of things that deference epistemology tends to focus on. They need clean pipes, clean water, and um, a political strategy to get it. And so that's what they worked towards. They worked in active collaboration with scientists who had laboratories that could counter the propaganda produced by um, the Michigan Department of Environmental Quality. They ran a citizen science campaign. They supplemented it with a legal campaign. What they got initially was a mix of platitudes and mockery from the ruling elite, including then President Barack Obama, um, but they kept at it. And the last year, the service lines were replaced and the state of Michigan was forced to pay hundreds of millions of dollars in a settlement for affected families. Now, that's not a total victory in any sense. Attorney fees are gonna cut a substantial portion of payouts um, a lot of the medical damage is irreversible, and that's par for the course. You know, we can't, by adopting a different epistemic orientation, totally overthrow all of the power asymmetries between the imperial state system and those of us who live within it. But this approach to standpoint epistemology makes the political game a little more competitive. Um, and the deference epistemology game isn't even playing. So if you were to ask me um, in general, what a politics rooted in this other approach to standpoint epistemology and social justice and anti-racism and anti-oppression looked like, 
Um, it would involve identifying these kinds of structural threats, including the corporate monopolization of local news, the interference of corporations and governments in key democratic processes and their control of knowledge and increasingly of attention. Um, and that just wouldn't look very much like centering particular spoke people's, spokes people's um, projects or art or um, perspectives. It would look like building new rooms. So I wanna say one last bit about trauma um, because I think it plays a role in the way that people talk about this sort of thing. And it's something that I take especially seriously. Um, and I don't think it would be right to talk about this without at least acknowledging this aspect of why it is that people adopt for politics as focused on what's happening in the room. And I'm kind of guided by this quote that James Baldwin said back in 63, um, where he articulated a different relationship to the kind of knowledge that you get from pain than I think is currently in vogue in a lot of um, social justice spaces that I inhabit. The constructive approach this thing that I'm talking about, building across rooms, um, is a demanding one. It asks us to be accountable and responsive to people and situations that aren't in the room with us, that aren't in front of us. Um, and the reason people don't adopt this has to do with concern and attention to the importance of lived experiences, especially of traumatic experiences. Um, and on the one hand, the focus and import that people give to traumatic experiences is something that I share. Um, I grew up in a community populated by people who had genocide and living memory in a place that was profoundly shaped by the ongoing intergenerational traumas of chattel slavery and what came along with it. Um, and myself, just in my own individual experience, um, have had many traumatic experiences. And I just don't, you know, it's as a response to all of that, that I don't have quite the perspective on trauma that other people have. I don't think it wasn't my experience of any of these things that trauma was in the default, at least a building block or a credential or something to be celebrated or something that has knowledge as its most likely consequence. If we are very fortunate, I think, traumatic experiences can be building blocks. And this is a thought that's built into feminist standpoint epistemology. Um, as my colleague Brianna Toole explains, um, there is a idea called the achievement thesis where um, feminist standpoint epistemologists clarify that um, social location or your identity puts you in a position to know, um, but you only get epistemic advantages through deliberate and concerted struggle from that position, right? It's not a default. It's not something that um, goes without saying. And we can certainly build with such experiences, but I think those experiences can also be destructive. And if I had to bet on which was more likely, it would be the destructive guess. I think pain is a poor teacher. I think suffering is partial and short-sighted and self-absorbed. And I don't think we should have a politics that expects anything different. Um, oppression is not a prep school. Um, and I chose that language very deliberately because I think it's the infection of our increasingly credential driven social structure that I think is at work in the view of trauma that has begun to proliferate. Um, trauma is not credential. I think the way that deference tries to 
conscript trauma into this approach to politics um, is unfair. I think it asks something of trauma that it can't give. It asks the traumatized to shoulder burdens alone or out in front that we should be sharing. And I think the dirty underside of the pedestal on which we place trauma is the attempt to hide below trauma, to hide our politics below our own trauma, to hide ourselves below and behind the politics of traumatized people. Um, I think that's unfair. I think we should reject it. I don't think that's the lesson to learn from trauma. Um, I think it's enough to be here after it. And that's enough to ask of those kinds of experiences. But perhaps more, the thing that I believe most powerfully about trauma is that the treating it as a credential doesn't just make the wrong guess about whether or not it builds or destroys, but it involves a backwards relationship of how trauma relates us to other people. In fact, traumatic experiences are common. They are unfortunately common given how brutal this world is. And in fact, that is one of the aspects of the world that we should recognize in fighting for justice. And that should be a central motivation for us fighting for justice. Trauma is awful. It is destructive, but it is also mundane. It is also what makes us most like the people around us and not what separates us from the people around us. And I think the politics that comes from that understanding that treats the vulnerability that trauma exemplifies as a bridge between us and other people rather than as a wall is the only kind of politics that has the potential to change the world and the kind of politics worth developing. And from that politics, I think, you know, we have to ask tough things of ourselves and we have to ask those same tough things of the people around us, but I think it's worth doing. Thank you. Wow, okay, Th thank you, Femi. Um, that, that's a really powerful ending. Um, I was gonna ask you some questions about your work on green politics and social justice, but it feels a bit askew from where, where we've gone with the conversation. So I'm gonna just just maybe recap, because the, the moments in there that were quite dense, I just wanna recap some of it. So to start with the with the you know, the finishing point around trauma, it's obviously really important to respect other people's trauma. That that just seems like a, an ethical priority and a moral priority. Your your argument seems to be that um, if we if we respect other people's trauma as a way to, I think you said kind of hide or kind of like, um, yeah, hide to, to kind of hide structural inequalities and the conditions by which we come to talk to each other and be in a position to respect other people's traumas, then you're kind of doing sort of, um, you're, doing, you're doing more injustice in a way in, in the larger sense. So it's almost as though there's a, you know, if, if you're paying too much attention to an individual's trauma, you end up obscuring like the structural conditions by which that trauma happened in the first place. And you, don't you're not able to then mobilize collectively to get to address that first you know the, the, the structural conditions is that would that be a fair recap of what you said yeah i think it's a fair recap and i think um but i think it's you know it's maybe even bleaker than that it's not just that um you often fail to um call attention to the structural factors that are at play, both in why we're able to have the interaction. Um, but 
but we also are using the structural factors in a way that actually precludes us from paying attention to the most marginalized, right? Because, you know, the most marginalized are usually not participating even as individuals, but certainly not as a group, right? And so we're, by rendering individual a thing that is um, systemic, we're doing a thing that makes it less likely that we're able to address the actual group, the marginalized group as a whole. Um, yeah. Right. So, so in a way, by respecting, it's kind of a very difficult conversation because you, you don't want to get in a situation where you disrespect other people's traumas. Right. In terms of the problem, as you describe it, by respecting other people's traumas and being very, you know, the deference epistemology, you're saying, I recognize, I know something of, of the trauma of the other by listening to them, being attentive, and so on. Um, it, in a way, the, the kind of reward, the way you recognize yourself as a good person for doing those things, just means you don't have to pay attention to the rest of the world by which you get into that position. And to me, that, 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 that becomes then, that's actually, to me, quite a good description of something that you've described, like we see a lot in universities. And in a way, it's a way in which current forms of uh, anti-racism are kind of configured. That this is how we should do it by paying attention to individual traumas and histories. And I see it a lot in the art system as well. It seems to be a kind of prevalent form by which uh, art institutions are supposed to, um, uh, yeah, kind of hear the voice of the other previously marginalized voices and so on. And there's something kind of really compelling for me. Uh, and one of the reasons I really wanted you to speak in the series um, was to kind of start to think about what the problems are with that, because it's self-evidently good, good thing to do, but in a way it's also a kind of uh, reward for the people who offer that space of listening or who you know, agree to, to do the listening when others are. Um, but I think, I think I was interested in a point, so that, that seemed to be to, to kind of demonstrate the point about how the strength of standpoint theory has become its weakness because it kind of prevents structural conditions being addressed uh, not just in the room, but outside of the room. But I was interested in um, social media um, as a place where you mentioned at the end about how elites structure attention economies, which is obviously a social media phenomenon. But it seems to me in social media, all you're left with really is attending to other people on a one-to-one -one basis, right? right. So the, what often happens is somebody makes a point and it becomes like a pylon about whether they did something egregious by not hearing a point well or saying the wrong thing but it becomes very individuated. And so the, the, the kind of the way the politics gets constructed or the, the discourse gets constructed, it's not necessarily elite in the way that the rooms are constructed because anybody can do be involved in the pylon, but there seems to be something about the individuation of the, you know, the, the, the uh, declared trauma or the egregious insult or offense that then leads to the pylon, which seems to kind of do the same type of action that you're describing. Yeah, and and I think this is the also you know this thing that you're talking about connects to um, a point I raised quickly in the beginning, which is the whole exchange rate between the attention economy and the material economy, right? Um, being an elite on uh, Twitter or Clubhouse or TikTok or whatever um, can translate into riches for some, you know, a, a handful of influencers maybe, um, but doesn't seem to bear any necessary relationship to group progress, right? So in a way, it's the old story of elite capture, but with a different sense of elites, right? Being very rich doesn't necessarily mean you're an elite on Twitter, right? The elite might be the person with the high follower count or the person who can mobilize retweets um, irrespective of, you know, how they stand in relation to others in other aspects of social life, right? But but other than that difference, I think the the story is the story is quite similar, right? The dynamics that drive uh, popularity on Twitter and um, the social rewards of 
that room of interaction are very local, right? They're these interactions, sometimes they're between a handful of people, sometimes they're between a few more people, but they're focused on, you know, kind of necessarily um, aesthetic aspects of political interaction. Did you use this hashtag? Have you tweeted about this, et cetera, et cetera? Because those are the things you're in a position to evaluate for the most part online. Um, and those kinds of things aren't unimportant, but those aren't the things that decide whether or not people have water or whether they remain in energy poverty or whether they're out of energy poverty or whether the refugee camps end up resettling people or whether or not they continue to warehouse people. Those, that's not the terrain on which those battles are won and lost. Um, and yet they operate to orient, powerfully orient our attention on how to think about that actual terrain on which those battles are won and lost. So I'm gonna just 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 to round off. I mean, uh, that sounds like the the way the way we conduct those arguments, moments of empathy, and so on social media. It's almost like it's a training ground for thinking of racism as ideology rather than racism as structure. I mean, in the case of racism, but presumably also for other kinds of social stratification. Also, you're you're required to engage with it on this very individualistic basis and deal with things as moral or ethical errors rather than as structural political power disparities. Right. Okay. Right. And and on the sense of moral morality and ethics that is itself developed in these rooms of interaction and not the one that would be developed mm -hmm. if we were having different interactions or if different interactions had social priority. All right, I've got I got a whole bunch more questions. Um, I confess it was a very selfish invitation because I already wanted to talk to you. <laughs> <laughs> it's like, are there any other James? Are there any more questions from people? Uh, there's just one that has turned up, or in fact two that's turned up. Um, so maybe let's hear from Jesse. Jesse, could you could you come on video? Hello. Yes. Thank you for a, a really, really, really interesting talk. Um, I've got a question. I hope, I hope it makes sense. Well, I'll, I'll try it. Um, so yeah, you listed like some alternative construction projects for the room, for example, addressing media and the power of kind of a new tech elite. But I'm wondering if you have ideas about what the new rooms look like, i.e. what forms of uh, solidarity or structures do we need to build? Um, to do these projects and yeah I'm just wondering how they develop from forms structures or forms of solidarity that we kind of have inherited uh, yeah thanks yeah I think I think you know in many ways that is the question so I'll just give um, I'll just give a couple examples of the kind of thing that I'm thinking about one is um, the interactions that residents of Flint had with the laboratory scientists, right? Um, the reason I thought that was such a good example is because, you know, there was a clear practical unity of what both of those sides of people were trying to accomplish. And so, you know, the interactions that they had, um, that's not to say that they were perfect. I'm sure there were arguments and disagreements. Um, you know, I'm sure that the, you know, resource inequalities between the residents and the people who had laboratory access mattered. Um, but they didn't make the collaboration impossible, right? And in fact, the collaboration depended on exploiting exactly those inequalities. Um, so, you know, a lot of times we you know, there's a there's a tendency to view um, differences in power dynamics as um, insurmountable, which I think 
isn't necessarily the case, right? Um, and the other example I think is, of course, the the union, right? The workers' union, but but not necessarily any example thereof, right? There's there's a long history of kind of um, entrenched powerful union bureaucracies that um, and or union leaderships that don't respond adequately to rank and file. So it's not that once we're in the space of talking about a union, we've automatically gotten to this magic organization that can't have internal problems. But you know, you think of um, a union with a democratic culture and structure, and what you're looking at is a group of people with um, some alignment of practical goals who are different people who you know, operate, you know, have different positions in the workforce, who have different identities, who, you know, um, come from different backgrounds, but who are nevertheless fighting for the same things and fighting together. And I think those are the kinds of rooms that produce the kind of politics that we need more generally. Great, thanks so much. Thanks. Okay. There's one more, yes, a comment rather than a question. Ah, oh, there you go. Please ask. Uh, ask. Yes. Hello, thank you. I've been thinking about this uh, element of the, the the politics of identity and and really how this articulates with public policy. Uh, and one of the things that it was more a comment than a question, as I said, I don't know if you look into that, was um, the the methodologies of research on peace psychology. Of so all the elements of peace psychology and peace studies have really worked out already um, through those. Uh, breaking points and elements and holistic perspective of things where we are, you know, this is just the researcher, the artist, the element that is in the in the specific room that we all know about it, actually brings in those those voices, but not in the say I want to give voice, not in that perspective of of uh, paternalist. So it's just something that I wanted to comment. If people are, I, I think it makes sense with your approach. Really, thank you. Thank you, and I I completely agree. Actually, um, I I haven't looked at the psychology specific stuff, so thanks for that. Now now I will. But um, when I was first working on elite capture, a lot of the best studies on like the actual phenomenon of elite capture were by P studies researchers. Um, so yeah, I think there's definitely a lot there, and that's one of the realms of practice where. Um, it's least surprising that people have answers because it's just very centrally what they're trying to do, right? Could you, could you or Sarah rehearse that, that moment where it, how it comes out of peace studies? The elite, most elite capture? Um, so so if, you, if, you're, if you're thinking about like trying to um, prevent or roll back conflict, right? Which is one thing that peace studies researchers are up to. Um, one plausible story about how conflict arises is the absence of um, ways of dealing with resource disputes or resource allocation type problems in ways that are recognized by all the people involved as fair and legitimate and binding. Right. Um, and in a way, you know, we think of war as between groups. Um, and so that's why it might not be initially obvious that elite capture is actually the same discussion. But if you look at the dynamics between the elites of a group and the non elites of a group, they're actually quite similar in a lot of ways to the dynamics between groups, especially when one group has advantages over the other. So actually, in terms of the peace building process, um, peace studies researchers, peace builders are actually trying to do the same thing um, that a um, union with a democratic culture would be trying to do, which is align different people with different advantages and different identities around a shared project that is mutually recognized. 
Okay, um, I've seen there's a hand raised by Fiona. Does that mean that you'd like to ask a question? If so, come on video. And if not, there is a question in the chat. Let's just wait a few seconds for Fiona and then I'll ask Nikolai, would you also like to come on video, Nikolai? Great. Go ahead. Hello. Thank you. Um, hi. Um, thank you so much for this talk. I, I wanted to ask about where you were talking about the tension economy, the material economy, and then I guess, I mean, there's been a lot of recent events that bring this to mind, but like a politics of optics and with like our government and then the opposition party functioning so much, like so much of what they do seems to be all tied to optics. So this idea of influence feels tangible through these mediums and like, what does this do? Um, I think. Yeah, I think there's an increasing reliance on optics by political elites, but I think that is symptomatic of another area of social organization where they have been successful, which is just information asymmetry between elites and non-elites. Um, and there's a variety of factors that explains why we've ended up in this situation, but um, two of them seem clearly to be um, related to each other and related to this phenomenon. One being the increasing um, kind of globalization of economic and political networks. And the second being the increasing complexity of economic and political networks, All right? So, um, you could imagine, um, or not imagine, you could think back to a hundred years ago to the many company towns that they were, that there were in many countries um, where a particular corporation controlled much of the housing and provision of utilities and was by far and away the largest employer in the town. And, you know, if something happened in that town, people generally knew why, right? They knew who was to blame, that information provided an accountability structure and so on and so forth. You know, who knows what a structural adjustment package is, right? Who even knows what the doing business index is, much less what decisions get made to decide um, what the doing business index says um, a country's ease of doing business is, um, or um, whose decisions related to the ability of capital to flow from Slovenia or Belarus into this particular part of Ecuador, for example, right? Um, as these things, you know, as it becomes further and further out of reach for people to understand what's happening in their daily lives and why in an institutional perspective, um, there's an increasing reliance on what people do understand, which is optics, um, representation, so on and so forth. Um, and so I don't think, so, so just to finally circle back to directly answering the question, my perception is that elite organizations are increasingly using optics because it addresses the one part of the kind of knowledge and attention economy that they don't just outright own um, or just aren't outright in a position to buy or lease from whichever other part of the ruling class does own it, All right? So, Mostly they've just bought politicians and bought regulators and um, bought tax havens. Um, and they're just scooping up what's left with 
greenwashing and um, the promotion of a small class of diverse co-conspirators. So now I can ask you the question about green politics. <laughs> so, so one bunch of your work is around elite, elite capture in relation to racism and anti-racism. And then you have some other work, which is obviously intimately connected to that, which is more, more explicitly about um, kind of current eco-politics and especially large scale eco-politics around um, geoengineering, I think, mm -hmm. but also how things, strategies like the Green New Deal, policies like the Green New Deal presented by you know, rich countries can have really catastrophic effects for people outside of the room in which that policy is being constructed. So I'm just wondering if you could kind of, again, give a quick outline of kind of what, what your claims are around that, around green politics and, and how, it, how it ties in with the elite capture argument. Yeah, I think that was a really helpful way of framing it, right? Um, a lot of people who will be affected by um, the decisions of oil and gas companies and um, even Green New Deal policies that aim to affect the decisions of oil and gas companies, a lot of those people just aren't represented or reflected or even acknowledged in much of the overall global discourse um, across the political spectrum. And I think that's um, what is maybe different about my take than some other people's. Um, so um, a policy like the Green New Deal or um, pledges like these net zero pledges that lots of corporations in some countries are making involve projections of um, large scale changes in land use. And, you know, there are political questions about who will bear the political costs and the economic costs and the environmental costs of those changes in land use. The carbon offset markets have been tied to um, expropriation, eviction, and violence towards indigenous peoples in the global south. Um, in particular, the African continent is um, at serious risk. Um, something like on the order of a full quarter of the arable land on the continent has been bought up um, by transnational capital, um, a combination of local elites, countries who have pension funds and multi multinational corporations um, in a process that was kicked off by the 2007 financial crisis. Um, and these are just questions that um, people are not asking. And even on the side of um, environmental justice organizations who oppose things like carbon removal and geoengineering because they um, are framing them in the context of their ongoing political fight with oil and gas companies, um, they are giving answers rooted in blanket opposition to oil and gas that don't come alongside real questions about what's going to happen to a number of people in the global south. So um, there was a letter signed by over 250 NGOs opposing um, an oil and gas project in East Africa, um, but the Green Climate Fund that was supposed to fund green development in the global south has raised something on the order of 7 billion out of the 200 billion that was promised. And that was well south of the over a trillion that was probably required to actually get the job done. So de facto, you have even the environmental justice organizations essentially building African energy poverty into their conception of green policy and green activism and there's no room of climate politics where those interests are represented and so i think you know the elite capture you know the elite capture way of thinking about this issue kind of 
powerfully describes what I take to be wrong with the present state of climate discourse, globally speaking. So just to, re I don't know if there are more questions, James will tell me in a minute, but just to recap that, because it seems to me really uh, a powerful insight. So in a way, the preoccupation with anti-corporate, anti-oil, anti-gas, and so on within you know, Europe, America, and so on, which is familiar politics for us, especially from the left, ends up producing, yeah, as you call it, like an energy poverty, but also the kind of buying up of, of land on the African continent, which doesn't serve the people in on that continent in their own terms. So you end up kind of reproducing the worst aspects of colonial extractivism, but through through an anti corporate politics. Exactly. Yeah, there's a kind of yeah, there's a kind of um, collateral damage way of looking at you know much of the global south small island nations, indigenous nations, the African continent um, in the war of Northern environmental justice versus multinational oil and gas. The answer about the questions is that there's nothing more in the chat at the moment, but I'd encourage people to put any final bits in there. Yeah, we've only got about 10 minutes. Yeah. Um, I'll, I'll ask one more. I think people digest. I think there's, there's quite a lot of um, new ways of entering into these discussions, which really are not the ones we're familiar with on certainly on our program. Um, so just to just to cycle back to the trauma moment that you finished with. Um, sorry for kind of hopping around so much. It just it was like such a rich talk with like lots of elements. Um, so we, one, one of the things around um, trauma, confession of trauma, the respect for trauma, the, and, and the, the deference epistemology that it obliges, um, is is in a way both both the person uh, expressing or articulating or showing trauma, and also the one um, receiving it, listening to it, hearing it, respecting it. Everyone in that scenario is individualized, and it's very specific. The narrative is always ultra particular. Um, and it's also kind of irrepro irreproducible uh, experience, right? And that, those seem to be really fundamental aspects to, uh, in a way, why, why I think it's such a um, compelling, compelling type of um, speech and narrative and uh, en enactment, um, because it, it, in a way that that's that's a kind of uh, way to refuse things like commodification, standardization. And sort of it belongs to that political space, but at the end, you were, you were saying that you know we need to 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 kind of do the work that you're suggesting, which is to kind of look at how we organize in solidarity around uh, ambitions beyond ourselves. Right. So we we kind of put aside some differences in order to kind of realize the collective goal. Um, you're saying that part of that is to kind of almost make trauma mundane. And to say that the thing that binds us is, is just the fact of trauma, um, not, not aside from, but um, our, our traumas are all individual, but the fact that we're traumatized is the thing that we have in common. And so we can start collectivizing on that basis. Um, but I was, I was wondering, one, whether you feel that this notion of, it's, it's almost like trauma discourse reinforces a kind of methodological individualism, which is a kind of key part of neoliberal polity. So neoliberalism is very much about individuals make decisions for themselves, irrespective of the larger harm, by some miracle that they don't describe, this ends up with a kind of collective good, which we now understand it doesn't. Um, but whether, whether the kind of solidarity you're asking for, obviously it's kind of greater than, than or different from the requirement for methodological individualism, um, but whether, um, yeah, I guess, I guess I'm trying to just make sense of this kind of de-particularized trauma in order to kind of find a collective, that, that almost doesn't sound like, I mean, it sounds like that's not trauma. Trauma is always about my trauma. 
I think this is. I think this is pushing on a kind of deep, a set of deep questions about the nature of experience and the relationship between experience and knowledge. So one, you know, I think maybe the thing to say first is that what I'm positioning myself against is the kind of invocation of trauma as credential rather than the invocation of trauma itself. Could you right? say a little more what that means, trauma as credential? Right, so there's a way of presenting trauma that is, I think, tied too closely to the ideas of um, epistemic advantage. Like I, I have knowledge of this thing because I have trauma or perhaps I have authority over this kind of topic because I have trauma. And I think that way of presenting trauma um, positions it as something exceptional. And it's actually the positioning of trauma as exceptional that is the thing that links to methodological individualism or that links to um, kind of opposition to solidarity, right? But it's not intrinsic to trauma itself. It, and it's not even intrinsic to the presentation of trauma. You know, one thing I was often encouraged by are, you know, reading different, um, different political eras and seeing, you know, different uses that people made of traumatic experiences, whether it was, you know, whether it was Du Bois talking about um, seeing the aftermath of the lynching and what difference it made for him with respect to how he viewed the world in general, or whether it was, um, you know, a lot of the um, African Marxists who were comrades of Cabral, for example, who were reflecting on the aftermath of the colonial famines in the early 20th century. You know, there's another way, there's another thing we can do with trauma. There's another set of things we can do with trauma that involve a different at fundamental attitude towards it. You know, trauma isn't the thing, you know, as you said, trauma, it's important that trauma is mine, right? It's, it's, not, it's not yours. It's um, in a sense, in perhaps a qualitative sense, or at least in a location sense, you know, different from other people's. But what I think is nevertheless still possible is a view of trauma on which what is emphasized isn't that personal individual aspect of trauma. What is emphasized is its source, right? The reason why Lynch and why I have this experience that is formative to me is not that a lynching happened to me, but is that, you know, it's reflecting a kind of racial vulnerability that we all have because of the system of white supremacy. And it showed up in my life in this particular way. But what is important is not that it showed up in my life in this particular way, but is that what showed up in my life is a thing that is also true about your life, right? That we both live under this system of racial oppression. And so what I have uniquely is an insight about what to do about the situation we are both in or what is disgusting and frightening and dangerous about this situation that we are both in. You know, that is another, you know, that's another way that the individual can relate to their own experience. And it's the way of relating to your own experience that is not opposed to solidarity, but I think the most basic stuff of solidarity, right? If, you know, if the revolution, if the political action, if the teamwork, if the union friendship, or if any of these things require sameness, then we've lost already because we are not the same. 
We couldn't possibly be the same. But if what they require is something less stringent than sameness, but simply connection, then we have that already. And rather than pessimism, we should, we should have optimism. I may not experience, you know, I may not experience, you know, street harassment in the way that um, women do, but that is a part of the world that I live in. And insofar as I have a sense of justice, that's a thing that I should not want to be a part of the world that I live in. It doesn't have to happen to me for me to oppose it. It doesn't have to be part of my story in the first person singular way to be part of my story in the first person plural way. Something that happened to my union sibling, something that happened to my comrade. And that's enough. At least it had better be enough if we want to live in a world that's better than this one. Yeah, so my, 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 my trauma is a power effect, which affects those many others. What do we do about that power? That, that would be the way to negotiate the traumas. So you change the conditions and hopefully prevent other people being traumatized in the same way. Right. Mitigate against it. Okay. All right, I'm gonna, it's gonna take me a while to think, to think my way through that. Um, I think we should stop, James, unless there are other questions. No, there's nothing more. I think it's a good moment. All right, um, Femi, thank you. Thank you so much. It's just an amazing way to finish, finish the series. Thank you All for right. having me. Appreciate thank it. you.